All right, let's get the show started. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending our first open house for the Amherst View West Secondary Plan. My name is Bowden Winicki, and I am the Township's Manager of Development Services. With me today are other Township members from our Amherst View West Secondary Plan Project team. We have MJ Merritt, Director of Economic Growth and Community Development. Uh, Jenna Campbell, Manager of Engineering in our Engineering Division. Andrea Furness, Supervisor of Planning Services and Katie, Amy, who's our administrative assistant, who's running the show here, kind of in the background, administering the, the, the open house. There's also team members from our partners in this project from WSP. We have Nadia DeSanti, the project team lead for their team. Um, Megan McMillan, who is overseeing the class environmental assessment that is related to the secondary plan. We have Michael Flowers, who's leading WSP's engineering department for the project, and Jill McDonald, who's providing assistance as a planner as well on the project. Just want to make a note that this meeting is being recorded. The team I just introduced has been managing the development of a whole host of background studies, which you will hear about shortly, as we work towards finalizing the secondary plan so we can bring it forward to Council for consideration later this year. The background work that is being discussed today has been developing since last summer. Many of the technical studies, but not all, have been completed, and as they are completed, you can find them all on our project website. Uh, more will be coming in the coming weeks, so stay tuned. Thank you. Are we showing the presentation? It's not showing up on the screen. Thank you. <laughs> So the uh, next slide, please. This is the agenda for today. We are just completing item one, which is opening remarks. What will follow is a presentation by the WSP project team, which includes a project overview, a presentation of draft background technical studies, the three draft land use concept options that have been developed, and uh, an evaluation of the uh, alternatives to, to those concepts. We will then have an opportunity for questions and answers from members of the audience, and we'll discuss next steps. The objectives for today are three of them, mainly to inform. By this, we mean to provide an overview uh, <clears throat> of all the background studies that have gone into production of the three land use options that are being presented. B, to consult that is to obtain feedback on these draft use concepts, and C, to involve, and that is to work with you to refine these land use concepts as they go forward. Next slide. Just a few housekeeping items before we start. Please mute your microphone while the presenter is speaking or until it is your turn to speak. If you are experiencing connection issues, we recommend turning off your camera to uh, minimize your bandwidth. You can chat to send a message directly to the project team and we will respond. Raise a hand when it, we come to the questions uh, and answer periods um, uh, and the moderator will bring you in uh, to make your um, comment or question and lower the hand when you are finished. As we have a lot of people attending this evening, please keep your comments between three and five minutes in order to allow everyone an opportunity to speak. Next slide, please. So let's begin with a brief recap of the project. This is the Amherst View West Secondary Plan Study Area. That's approximately 144 hectares in size or 346 acres. It's bound by Taylor Kidd Boulevard or County Road 23 to the north, Bath Road, Highway 33 to the south, the Parrots Bay Conservation Area to the west, uh, County Road 6, and the existing built up area of Amherst View to the east. Uh, existing uses in the study area do include some, some residential uses. Next slide. These are the declared uh, and council endorsed objectives for the project. Uh, one, to identify future needs and priorities for the future community of Amherst View West to the year 2046, including housing types, urban design, community amenities, protection of the natural environment, 
stormwater and servicing uh, interests and transportation, including active transportation opportunities. Uh, to prepare a land use plan, implementing the policies of the official plan for Amherst View West. The secondary plan will be implemented through an official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment. And finally, to prepare urban design guidelines that will guide the built form of the area and ensure compatibility uh, in the new developed community. Also parallel to this, we have been laying the groundwork for satisfying the municipal class assessment process. The MCEA will be integrated with the secondary plan to address land use servicing, transportation and environmental considerations. But the key milestone today is the release, public release of the three land use concepts that we feel could satisfy the objectives of this project. We wanna hear your feedback on these three alternatives and we will feed this into the analysis so in the coming weeks we can come up with a recommended land use option. And I want to stress, uh, the project team has not determined which of these options it prefers. At this point, we're waiting to get all the feedback back before we do that. So with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to Nadia Desanti and her team from WSP, who will describe the steps and analysis taken in preparation of these options. Over to you, Nadia. Thank you, Bowden, and good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Nadia DeSanti. I'm a registered professional planner and project manager for this secondary plan and municipal class EA process. Um, so moving on to the next slide, please. Um, as Bowden mentioned, we've been working on this um, since last uh, summer, uh, maybe even to last spring. And so this shows uh, the secondary plan and the MCEA integrated process and uh, the key opportunities for public review. We're currently wrapping up phase one with the completion of the background studies. And uh, we're also at phase three, uh, which includes the preparation of the draft land use concept options that we'll present to you tonight. And we've also had uh, meetings, uh, our second set of meetings with our technical advisory committee and coordinating committee. As shown on this slide, phase two is the public engagement process of which this open house is part of, and this will continue on through the um, phase, phases four and phase five. And um, in terms of the engagement, could you please kindly go to the next slide? So there are a whole host of groups um, and different organizations and um, membership in the public engagement process. So we've had uh, community representatives, stakeholders, um, we have reached out to the Indigenous communities as well as part of this process. And um, this is all part in working together and building up the partnerships and to ensure that we've captured input from all um, and help build the, uh, the secondary plan for the future of Amherst View West. Some of these groups include decision makers such as Township Council, technical agencies like the Cataraqui Region Conservation Authority, county staff, township staff, local community-based representatives through the coordinating committee, and of course the technical advisory committees made up of uh, some landowners, developers, um, and some other uh, technical staff from various um, departments at, at, at township level. As um, Bowden mentioned, we have a number of background studies that are shown on the next slide, and they, um, I'm not going to list them all, but you're going to hear from on most of these uh, studies tonight. And they have helped inform the preparation of the three land use draft options that uh, that we'll be discussing and there is going to be a background analysis report that one will summarize the key findings from each of these so if you have um, an interest in one of these specific uh, studies you can go there or if you just want to have a high overview the background analysis report uh, will capture all of these studies so as Bowden mentioned uh, these will be some of these will be made available um, on the project website and a couple of them are still being reviewed but will be posted on the project website in the weeks to come so next slide please um, as part of the secondary plan process 
a growth management analysis was uh, undertaken to assess the ability to accommodate projected future residential and employment growth and development in Amherst v. West. WSP prepared a growth management report in July 2021, and that was circulated to the Technical Advisory Committee and the Coordinating Committee, and that identified population dwelling and employment allocations for Amherst View West to the year 2046, so that's the 25-year planning horizon as required by the provincial policy statement. It also identified the required land areas to be designated residential and employment in the study area. Our growth analysis was based on the information provided in the population housing and employment projection study that was completed by Hempson in 2019 and subsequent correspondence with Hempson was made last year and along with County of uh, Lennox and Addington and Township staff. So this, um, the 2019 Hempson report was the same growth needs analysis that was referenced for the preparation of the um, adopted loyalist official plan that was adopted last uh, last fall. The findings of our growth management report found that the population for Amherst v. West was to grow by approximately 2,420 people and that would result in approximately 1,000 residential units to be uh, incorporated into the Amherst v. West. Uh, secondary plan area. The next slide, please. So in terms of that population and number of residential units, that uh, resulted in 20.47 net hectares of residential land to accommodate the 1,000 residential dwelling units and approximately 1.3 net hectares of commercial employment land to accommodate the to accommodate the forecasted commercial jobs. And when I refer to commercial, what that means is retail, personal service, uses, restaurants, hotel. It doesn't include um, any uh, industrial or light industrial uses. Um, It is assumed that those types of uses would be directed north to the existing Loyalist East Business Park, which is north of Taylor Kidd Boulevard. Next slide, please. So the uh, township's adopted official plan uh, sets out policies for low, medium, and high density. And this uh, table basically takes the uh, 1,000 units and breaks it down into those uh, densities. And so when we are looking at low density, this is referring to single detached, semi-detached duplex dwellings. Medium density refers to triplexes, quadruplexes, row housing, street towns, low rise apartments. And high density refers to stacked townhouses and apartment dwellings. So in terms of low density, we're um, applying the uh, density requirements. We're looking at 55%, so more than half of the uh, the land would be for low density housing of approximately 550 units at a gross density, max gross density of 37 and a half units per net hectare and a land requirement of about 14.67 net hectares. And then you can see the medium and high density um, calculations here. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Megan McMillan, to present the findings from the various background studies. Thank you and good evening, everyone. Um, we'll begin with this slide a uh, presentation of some of the key findings from the Natural Heritage Existing Conditions Report. Um, this is one of the, the key background studies that you will see kind of reflected in the land use concepts that we'll be presenting later on. And uh, this report was uh, prepared and developed based on a desktop analysis, consultation with regulatory agencies um, regarding existing conditions within the area and completion of field work last year. And the report pulls together all of these findings. And the figure that's shown here is is one of the figures contained in that report. And based on the information collected, we've kind of reviewed the the study area and classified uh, areas of of different levels of constraint in terms of the natural features that are present in those locations. So you'll see areas of high constraint shown in red. And the significance of, of the high constraint areas are things like provincially significant wetlands and the regulated setbacks from those features um, 
other features like significant woodlands and valley lands and watercourse crossings um, that typically have regulated uh, setbacks that that limit development um, within those areas. So that's what we mean when we when we present high constraint. Um, we've also identified areas such, that are kind of a moderate to high constraint area. So these are um, lands that might have important connection features to those higher constraint areas or wildlife linkages. Um, those are the orange colors and then kind of going down into the, the green to the moderate and then minimal constraint areas. And it's not to suggest that there aren't any natural features or natural areas within the minimal constraint areas. It's just to say that they're, they're less constrained in terms of the regulatory limitations placed on that and the significant significance, pardon me, of, of the habitat that's present. Um, so you'll see that the this feature has has fed, or sorry, this analysis in terms of the varying levels of constraint has has fed um, into the land use concept options that we'll be speaking about later this evening. So we can move to the next slide. <clears throat> Another key background study that our team completed was uh, to review the study area for potential cultural heritage features. And there were, were several properties that were identified within the, the, the study area as having potential cultural heritage significance. And this was based on an assessment, again, of, of background review of historical information about the study area, a site visit to the area by one of our, our heritage specialists who prepared recommendations in a cultural heritage resource assessment report that will, will also be available uh, for review and uh, and identified kind of three key properties that were then recommended uh, to to the townships council um, for protection under the the municipal register of properties of cultural heritage value or interest and among those properties kind of the, the largest one there on, on the the far east limit of the study area is the Loyalist Farms property. For that property in particular, um, we're also completing a more detailed evaluation of the cultural heritage significance of that property to understand, you know, what are the features, what are the built features or the landscape features on this property that contain heritage value. Um, and that's determined using evaluation criteria under the Ontario Heritage Act. Um, so that, that work is ongoing to better understand and, you know, the significant features on that property, if any. And we can move to the next slide. <clears throat> So on this slide, if you were present in our, our visioning workshop that was held uh, late spring or early summer of last year, I believe it was in, in June, we held an online visioning workshop and a community survey in order to develop a vision statement for the Amherst View West secondary plan area. So using the feedback collected through the visioning session and through the, the survey online, we analyzed the, the feedback and developed a draft vision statement for the Amherst View West area. It's shown on the screen here and uh, I'd like to to read out loud um, that that vision statement that was developed with public input as well as input from township staff and both the technical advisory and coordinating committee so Amherst View West celebrates its distinctive and scenic location along Lake Ontario and proximity to Parrots Bay Conservation Area. As an extension of the greater Amherst View community, Amherst View West will grow and develop as a family-oriented, friendly area with a small town feel, providing a balance and excellent quality of life for residents and a peaceful and natural environment to live, grow, and visit. So this is one of the, the items that that we'd like to invite your feedback on um, as part of this session and, and following this session because it is a draft vision statement and it will form the basis from which the objectives and the policies of the secondary plan will, will flow from this vision statement and support this overall vision statement. We can move to the next slide. Now on this slide, uh, on this slide as, as we've mentioned earlier, the secondary plan is being developed in tandem with a municipal class environmental assessment process that's uh, following a, a master plan process under the municipal class EA um, process. So the, the municipal class EA is, is geared towards looking at the infrastructure and the tra transportation requirements in order to serve the secondary plan area. So its focus is, is slightly different than the secondary plan, but similar to you know, the secondary plan having as its foundation a vision statement, uh, the municipal class EA process, the master plan, uh, begins with 
setting a problem and opportunity statement. And that's what we've drafted on, on this slide here. And again, invite you know, feedback and comment on. And this was also developed with input received from the visioning session, from our background uh, report review, from township staff and the committees. And I'll read this out loud, but again, just um, to perhaps uh, explain the significance of this. So in, in terms of the municipal class EA process, this really forms the basis of the problem, the issue, or to put a positive angle on it, the opportunity that we are trying to achieve through the development of this master plan. So it's again, a foundational piece of, of that document. So the, the key, key elements of the problem opportunity statement are First, that while there is some existing residential development within the secondary plan study area, land suitable for future residential and commercial development have not been identified to accommodate the anticipated population and housing growth. The existing road, active transportation, water and sanitary sewer network within and adjacent to the secondary plan area needs to be extended to service planned growth and meet existing municipal design standards. Future urbanization of the secondary plan study area requires an overall strategy to manage future stormwater flows while considering potential effects resulting from climate change and ensuring that natural heritage systems, including watercourses and woodlands and their buffer areas are not degraded. And lastly, the integrated secondary plan and class EA process provides an opportunity to allow for an integrated and coordinated approach to addressing land use, servicing, transportation, and environmental considerations, and ensuring that such considerations are fully integrated into the decision making process. So with that, I will turn it back uh, to Nadia to continue the presentation. Thanks, Megan. So the draft guiding objectives um, that we're going to show on the next two slides are um, again draft and we are looking for your input tonight and I will um, we will have a check in on the draft vision statement and the these guiding objectives and momentarily, but these have been drafted to help implement the draft vision statement so i'm not going to read all of them, but i'm just going to pick up a. a pick on a few. Uh, so again, to uh, accommodate urban development in a westerly direction and Amherst view is directed by the township's official plan. Recognize that we do have existing residential um, properties within this area and ensure their protection from incompatible development or redevelopment. Um, ensuring that we have um, some commercial lands to enhance um, the amenities that exist in Amherst View West, but also, um, or in Amherst View, but to en enable uh, some other commercial and economic opportunities in Amherst View West. And we heard this through our visioning session that was held last uh, last summer um, about the need for, you know, coffee shops, personal service uses, et, et cetera. So you'll see some commercial land use designations proposed um, on the three land use options. On the next slide, please. The draft guiding objectives continue. And here um, we want to respect the existing character of Amherst View West, ensure the protection and preservation of provincially significant natural features and other important uh, natural features and cultural heritage resources. Um, ensuring that tr transportation connection, um, not only within the secondary plan area, but throughout uh, to other um, communities and built up areas. And we will be um, having a, an urban design standards document um, that is going to be prepared um, on the preferred land use options. We don't have anything to present to you tonight, but those standards will include um, items such as access and circulation, built form, open space, site sustainability, uh, climate change resiliency. So that will help uh, future development in the secondary plan area. And again, um, the secondary plan uh, is to ensure that there's a framework um, that uh, includes the flexibility for uh, the redesignation of uh, potential future development areas. Um, in the uh, in the secondary plan. So we're going to do a check in on the next slide, please. And we, um, we we have more to present, but we wanted to just pause right now and just to see if there are any questions on the material presented so far. If there's any comments on the draft vision statement or the guiding objectives. Um, again, um, we're just going to 
take a pause here and then um, then we're going to move into the the draft land use options so if you have a question you can type it in the q a or raise your hand So there is a question here. Um, will we be getting a larger ambulance space that will accommodate more ambulances as we grow? So I will turn that over to Bowdoin um, to answer that question. Thank you, Nandi. Um, so yeah, and uh, we did reach out to uh, um, Loyalist uh, Emergency Services uh, for um, an answer to, to that question precisely, and they they said that uh, at this time, they don't foresee a need for a new, new ambulance station or, or fire station. Thank you for that question. Are there any other uh, questions? Um, Katie, is there anyone who's dialed in potentially that may not have, um, may not be on the, the link, the Zoom link? scrolling through the list of attendees here I don't see any raised hands at the moment um I don't see anyone who's called in by phone okay 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 great thank you okay then um we will uh move on then if there aren't any questions but if something comes up later on on the draft vision statement or guiding objectives or the process um uh we can answer them uh later on Okay, so now we're going to move into um, the land use assumptions, and these are, um, you know, the basic starting points for the development of the, the land use concepts. Um, so I mentioned already the population growth, the housing, the employment. In terms of parkland, we... Um, we're looking at approximately 6.05 hectares of neighborhood parkland to be added in this area by 2046. We, uh, with the township, have reached out to the school boards and only one school board identified a need for a school block. So we uh, have assumed a two hectare school block, which was what the school board had identified as the land area needs. And then in terms of planned road works, the county is to, um, gonna, undertake roundabout design at County Road 6 and Taylor Kid Boulevard and roadworks 200 meters south. So we wanted to um, note that there is also some county road uh, work being done in the, in the area. Okay, so we're gonna move to the uh, first draft land use concept one. Um, thank you. Um, so, the um, these draft land use concepts that um, you're going to see tonight um, have uh, gone through the coordinating committee, the technical advisory committee, and um, we are looking for public feedback on these uh, concepts tonight. And again, these are um, based on the technical information that we have from all those background reports, building on the vision statement, the problem opportunity statement, for the class municipal class EA and the assumptions. Um, so the at a high level, these concepts will show a proposed road and active transportation network, land uses and their densities. Um, it also includes parks and open space, the school block, low to high density residential area. So remember the table where we had the low, medium and high. So we've got different land use categories for each of those, as well as commercial employment areas and environmental uh, protection areas. So um, one thing that um, we've noted on all of these options um, in the legend and in the, um, in the, just in the text, is that uh, the cultural heritage, natural heritage and, and servicing information, all of those are going to be shown as different schedules, so similar to what you would see in an official plan for natural heritage transportation. We're gonna have those more detailed schedules, but only on the preferred land use option. So, um, and there will be specific policies in the secondary plan that's, that refer to those schedules and, um, the elements that are shown 
uh, on those various schedules. So the, um, the one thing that I want to mention too is um, all three concepts are similar in that they uh, show future development mostly occurring along the eastern limit of the steady area. So here we are seeing future development along uh, County Road 6 corridor, the extension of Amherst Drive, connections to Kildare Avenue, Wald Walden Pond Drive, multi-use path connections to the existing residential area by Bayview Drive and Parrots Bay Lane and to Parrots Bay Conservation Area. We also are showing general locations of future municipal stormwater and wastewater facilities. This option also illustrates a water crossing at Lost Creek and access to Taylor Kidd Boulevard. The future development, um, um, potential for future development is shown in gray. And many of those, um, the red and orange areas that was presented by Megan on the natural heritage slide, um, are, you know, forms part of those, um, those, those lands. And so um, much of that is, uh, is also tied to um, those red and orange areas that were illustrated earlier. On the next slide, we are seeing a slightly different arrangement of land uses. Uh, the one uh, key thing here is that this option does not include the Lost Creek crossing. We're showing a wider collector loop and some commercial employment, medium density park uses around Amherst Drive. And then on the third option, again, a, a different rearrangement of the land uses. We're showing a smaller collector loop um, from Walden Pond to Kildare Avenue and an extension of Amherst Drive. There's also a larger park open space proposed with the low density area south of the Amherst Drive extension. The other thing I want to mention is all three options um, also identify a gateway feature, which is illustrated by the black um, star. Um, so kind of having that um, as a focal point, as the uh, opening or welcoming into the new community. Um, so that is, uh, is also the same on all three options. So the other thing that we um, would like to hear from the public today is on the um, alter evaluation of alternatives and the criteria that we're going to be using. Uh, to assess these options and based on your input. So I'm going to turn it over to Megan to present the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so to inform the evaluation of the different options that we've just presented, we've come up with a number of criteria which are presented on the slide here. They're grouped under the different themes of the built environment, land use, social and cultural environment, natural environment, pardon me, technical considerations and financial considerations. Um, so in terms of the built environment, we're going to be comparing the alternatives in terms of how well um, they achieve transportation objectives of providing a, a range of, of modes of transportation to service the, the future secondary plan area. We're going to be looking at the open space and parks um, incorporated within each of the options and how well they achieve the objectives of of, of the township in terms of uh, in terms of the area required for for open space and parks, and we're going to be looking at the the ability to service um, with the required municipal infrastructure uh, the future development area. In terms of land use, we're going to be looking at criteria that include um, consistency with the town's township's approved plans and policies. Uh, we're going to be comparing how well each of the options accommodate the targets laid out in the, the growth management report that we prepared. We'll be looking at aspects of land use compatibility, how compatible the future development is within the existing uh, community, and we'll be looking at land acquisition implications. So um, comparing the different alternatives in terms of citing public infrastructure on um, lands that would need to be acquired by the township. 
in terms of social and cultural environment, we'll be comparing the alternatives in terms of potential impacts to archaeological resources, which may be present in the area, as well as the cultural heritage resources that, that we spoke about earlier. Um, in terms of the natural environment, we'll be looking at potential impacts to the terrestrial environment and the features that were identified through that, that background report. We'll be looking at impacts to the aquatic environment, primarily that um, water course that bisects the, the secondary plan area. And we'll be looking at how well the, the options achieve water quality and, and quantity control objectives. In terms of technical considerations, the criteria include uh, the ability to achieve the objectives of the problem opportunity statement that we, we presented earlier, uh, how well the alternatives support the township's infrastructure master plan, which is under development and the objectives through that study, the feasibility of construction, uh, the access and the maintenance requirements for each of the alternatives, and how well the alternatives support uh, climate change and resiliency objectives for the township. And then lastly, under financial considerations, we'll be doing a high level comparison of, of the capital costs of, of of the options. And the evaluation will be carried out on a qualitative basis, comparison of the three options. And I think to give an indication of, of what this kind of evaluation process will look like, we've got on the following slides, if we can advance to the next slide, just looking at a few different criteria um, and providing some commentary on, on each of the options. And this is to give you an idea of how these evaluation criteria um, will be applied to the land use concept options when we go through this process. So in terms of option one, looking at the natural environment impacts, this option has greater environmental impacts because it requires a watercourse crossing for the north-south collector road connection up to Taylor Kid Boulevard. So that has a greater impact on the natural environment. That also introduces higher costs for construction and maintenance because it will require a, a culvert or a bridge structure to cross that watercourse. It does have advantages in the sense that it provides greater opportunities to distribute traffic. There are a greater number of points of entry to the secondary plan area. So this is just to give a, a sense of the type of qualitative evaluation or uh, qualitative evaluation will be will be carrying out using all of those criteria that I, I spoke to earlier. So we can move to the next slide to look at, at option two. So this option um, avoids a watercourse crossing. There's a, a lesser impact to the natural environment as a result of that. It's a slightly more compact uh, built form. It has greater servicing connections required to connect uh, to the southernmost lower density residential area. And that results in some higher maintenance and, and operational costs potentially. For the next slide, we can... This has a lower degree compared to the other two alternatives of impacts to the natural environment because development is concentrated along the Highway 6 corridor and the proposed footprint of that collector road avoiding the watercourse crossing is, is minimized. Um, it also provides a greater opportunity for infrastructure connections to the existing built up area on the east side of County Road 6. So this is just to give a sense as to how we'll be carrying out this evaluation of alternatives using all of those criteria that we presented and we welcome your feedback on those criteria as we uh, move into the next phase of the study, which is to go through this evaluation process in detail. And we can move to the next slide, which Michael will present. Thank you, Megan. So I'm going to be going over an overview of the servicing alternatives um, considered for all three land use concepts. Um, there's many similarities and it, it provides also some additional rationale on, on the selection of growth from the westerly extents or the easterly extents rather going westerly. Um, before getting into water systems shown here, I just want to mention that um, secondary plan also included a study of composite utilities inclusive of IT communications, natural gas and electrical, and it's detailed in the composite um, utility background report. And those connections are looking to expand from existing services, um, primarily located on the perimeter of the secondary plan area to the north along Taylor Kid, 
east on County Road 6 and south from Bath Road. So getting into the water system, this is a image displaying the existing uh, municipal distribution system. The, there will be a proposed looped water main distribution system expanding into the secondary plan area um, from the east going westerly. And the loop distribution system will allow for future development considerations. So those gray areas um, presented in all land use concepts um, with the allowance of um, connections, that, which also account for things such as sizing, which is appropriate for maximum day demand, average day demand, and maximum day demand plus fire flow. Um, these connections are going to tie in primarily around County Road 6, Bath Road to the south, with some of the land use concept options also providing and looking at connections to the north to Taylor Kid to the Loyalist East Business Park. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, looking into servicing for wastewater systems, um, there's primarily two areas um, that we're looking at from a servicing perspective, um, which will allow us to logically expand um, the collection system and connect to the existing infrastructure in Amherst View. So this, the topography of this area primarily is a divide um, from lands to the north and lands to the south, where systems that include gravity sewer collection um, areas north of Amherst Drive generally drain towards the Lost Creek area. So we're looking at the expansion and development of gravity collection sewers to the north to connect to the Taylor Kid Boulevard pumping station, which leads to the Amherst View West Wastewater Pollution Control Plant. So this allows for the completion and connectivities and um, defers the requirement for um, dedicated pumping stations to later phases in the development of the secondary plan area. This primarily includes areas to the south of Amherst Drive, which do not allow or are unable to provide a direct gravity sewer connection um, due to the existing topography. And also there is currently no existing um, gravity sewers along Bath Road. There is opportunities to connect directly across from County Road 6 for development that is adjacent to the roadway. But as development expands towards the west into these other areas, um, there will be requirements for a new pumping station facility. Um, this facility may be reviewed to be pumped to the provided gravity sewers, which will be sized accordingly, or can provide dedicated pumping up towards the treatment plant. Um, these options can be reviewed at later phases. Going to the next slide, which revolves around stormwater management. Um, this provides more detail, this slide of these divides of the watershed areas and collection areas. So to the north, area one shown on the figure here is the Lost Creek watershed, where it lands and surface flow generally flows towards Lost Creek. And this collection area um, is separated from the area to the south, south of Amherst Drive, which is area two, which is inclusive of the Edgewood Municipal Drain. Um, this drain um, has restrictions for development that can be overcome through the appropriate stormwater management and collection. Um, there's a target for the secondary plan to reduce by 20% um, preconditions to post conditions. And it's an opportunity as this land is developed um, to identify strategic locations for stormwater management collection areas that all the development areas can collectively use um, to minimize on-site stormwater management and collection, which can create a, a larger land use requirement for these developments. The target is to align with the draft technical design guidelines, which are currently under development as part of the township's infrastructure master plan. Um, You'll notice here that there is some uh, wetlands that are unevaluated um, on some of the properties. Um, the, as development um, continues forth, any loss of depression storage areas um, would be evaluated as well. 
Um, but the land that's set aside is to allow for the, um, full development of those areas up to the growth projection. Um, so moving into the next slide now, I'm going to describe some more about the phasing and implementation um, of the three phases of development and what areas would develop first um, under this projection, which is inclusive of the infrastructure requirements to service this. So under phase one, we're looking at the first 10 years, around 490 dwelling units. Um, we'd expect to see expansion of Amherst Drive the collector and improvements to the intersection, which will act as that gateway feature. Um, there's gonna be some proposed um, reconstruction of County Road 6 corridor. So implementation of multi-use trail and connections will be implemented at that time. Um, the stormwater management facilities to the north um, will also be developed at this time to accommodate as well as the construction of the gravity collection systems for sewers and the water distribution systems. Moving into longer term projections within the secondary plan projection scenario. Um, five years after that, we're looking at the expansion of the road network, which includes roads to the south. And that's what will then trigger the stormwater ma water management facilities in the Edgewood Municipal Drain Area. Uh, we'd also anticipate that the trail networks um, shown on the draft land use concepts will be developed at this time. Um, and also um, that um, the Maltese trails along the collector roads would also be developed. Then looking into the longer range or phase three projection, um, we'd be looking at completion of the collector road network, establishment of the trails, and any of those final servicing components, which may include uh, the introduction of a new pumping station for sanitary collection. Um, we would also see final completion of parks around this time. Um, I will now hand it back to Nadia, who will um, add some additional insights and uh, move us towards our Q&A session. Thanks, Michael. And before we uh, move off this slide, I just wanted to um, also state that as part of the secondary plan and the draft secondary plan, um, when it comes to the phasing and implementation section, um, you know, the policies are a guide. And if market chain, market, um, you know, continues to be strong, things change, uh, there's opportunities to, um, to move forward with different phases. So it doesn't mean that, um, that when the policies are, uh, the policies provide a framework, but if the if things change and things continue to um, you know the growth uh, continues, the township has the flexibility to bring on lands sooner. So I just want to ensure and uh, communicate that the policies are just there as a framework. They are meant to be flexible. We know that. Um, that you know, lots of places in Eastern Ontario are growing and Loyalist Township is one of them. So um, these phases and the numbers are not a fait accompli, they are not set in stone. So the policies will be flexible to accommodate that. So I just wanna make sure that um, people are aware that, um, um, that the, the secondary plan policies will provide that flexibility. So, we are now at 6.50, so we've got an hour and uh, 10 minutes. We do have, um, uh, if we can just move to the next slide, please. Um, we'll just save maybe five minutes at the end. There's a next step slide that I will present and then turn it to vote and to close off. But right now we are in the Q&A session. Um, and um, I see that there are some questions. So I will um, go to the to the first one. Um, and so again, if, if we need to pull up uh, any of the land use options or the evaluation criteria, Katie will kindly pull that up for us. So I'm just gonna go to the first question. Um, is any development proposed on the land indicated as potential heritage value? So I'm gonna turn that question over to Megan for a response, please. 
Yes, so um, you, you may have noticed as we went through the land use concept options, there are varying impacts to the loyalist, uh, the loyalist acres farm property. And it's exactly for that reason that we are completing that more detailed cultural heritage evaluation for the property to really understand what are the features on this property that have heritage value if, if it meets the criteria under the Heritage Act for heritage value? And if so, you know, what are those features and, and how do they need to be protected? So are they the built features like the barn, uh, like barns, for example, or is it the broader landscape, the entire property itself? So that's, that's exactly why we're doing that more detailed um, review of the heritage features on the Loyalist Acres Farm property um, to really understand what those features are. And the different land use concept options have varying degrees of kind of impact on that land. I think in, in one case, it would only be a transportation connection to connect to Amherst Drive that would, would impact the property. In other cases, there is some development shown on the north, um, north end of the property. So in, in, in order to really inform the evaluation of alternatives, that's why we're completing that, that more detailed study to really understand what are those features, um, if any, that contain the cultural heritage value under the Heritage Act. Um, if that explains a bit more. The other properties are not directly impacted um, through the, the land use uh, options that we've presented this evening. Um, so it, that's why the focus is, is on that, that larger uh, farm property. Okay, thanks, Megan. Katie, do you see any raised hands or should I go to the next Q&A? Not seeing any raised hands at this time. Okay. Um, so just a reminder, if you wish to speak, you can just click the raise hand at the bottom of the screen and, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll alternate the questions posted versus the raised hand. So, um, okay, the next question um, is for the potential future development area, what kind of time frame could we be looking at 10 plus years? So, um, so again, just to reiterate, we've... Um, the land uses that we've shown on the three concepts is to uh, the year 2046 and we'll have a phasing plan as uh, Michael presented and as I said um, you know if the growth happens faster then um, the township will react and will um, will um, bring those lands on sooner if needed. Um, Bowden, did you want to um, provide anything further on this question or comment? Yeah, um, just a couple of points. So <clears throat> the, the Hemson growth study upon which, um, sorry, population housing and employment study uh, on which th this is based, uh, that was done for the whole township. Uh, we f engaged Hemson as early on in this, in this uh, project to further narrow those projections down to uh, Amherst View West. And those are the numbers you see. Um, and because, because we're talking about a quite a significant investment of public money and infrastructure tied to this, uh, we have to base our decisions and our planning um, on the official numbers. And as Nadia just said, uh, what we can do is um, built in the policies to this official plan, the ability for us to uh, bring those future development lands on sooner if, if the situation changes, if the official data shows that we need to do that sooner, sooner rather than later. Um, so, so that's how we're approaching this. We're quite aware that uh, Eastern Ontario is experiencing an economic boom. We hope it continues. And if it does, and if the official numbers change, then Yes, we will bring those those lands on on sooner. Thanks, Bowden. So the next um, question: So is uh, what is the plan if twenty five year growth exceeds the projected land set aside? Should the larger piece of land be reviewed for growth beyond twenty five years, with limits to sewer, water, stormwater, transportation design, and leaving items such as housing types to a later date on the future lands? 
This would provide clear picture of growth and allow the landowners a timeline for use of their lands for other use, such as agricultural use. So um, I'll turn over to Michael to respond to the on the storm on the servicing and transportation uh, elements. Yeah, thank you for the, the question. Um, as a uh, Nadia and Bowden alluded to, there is um, a consideration and a mechanism for the future lands to um, be developed as the growth uh, warrants. On the sewer water, stormwater side, certainly the uh, the requirements um, to service those lands, there is a consideration in the, in the sense that the infrastructure being put into the proposed uh, collector roads and areas um, will be in place uh, much longer than the, the growth projection uh, scenario. So there will be sizing considerations of such to account for future growth. Um, the phasing that will be presented and the opportunity shown um, is looking at what infrastructure is needed now to get to that, that growth. Um, but yes, certainly the sizing and consideration for the other development areas are to be considered. Um, just one other additional note on that, for areas that are disconnected adjacent to these areas, um, such as those to the closer to Parrots Bay or, the, or towards the Northwest, where there is a, a disconnection of area or a separation due to um, topography or existing features that are part of the natural heritage assessment or um, within uh, a separation of water courses, there's most likely a requirement for a, a separate pumping station requirement or dedicated services to service portions of the land. Um, so again, those would all be future considerations, um, but the sizing and servicing here um, accounts for the adjacent land connections. Okay. Um, next question is, uh, how many schools can be accommodated in the space that will be saved for it? Um, is there a possibility for adding more space down the road if needed so our current schools are not overflowing? So um, to answer the first question, only one school uh, can be accommodated in that space that we've shown, and that was um, directly from one of the school boards. So only one school board identified a need to have a school block in uh, the Amherst View West area uh, at this point. As the potential future development areas uh, come on board, our plan for what what are what is the population projection for those um, lands, number of units, school boards would be um, um, contacted to see what their demands are. So that's you know another reason why the potential future development area. Um, the policies in the secondary plan are going to allude to not only residential, commercial, but there could be uh, another school or schools required. There may be a need for community amenities, such as a community center. Like those are all based on population. There's different thresholds. And so the potential future development area policies are going to um, include a variety of land uses because at this point, we don't know um, uh, what that population may be um, and what does that translate into number of units. And so uh, there could be um, a need for um, another school as population grows. Um, you know, the school boards uh, are definitely part of the process. And so they would be contacted early on, just like the township did early on in this process uh, to ensure that we um, confirmed whether uh, any schools would be needed. So only one school identified from one uh, school board. Next question is any plans to add outdoor places for families such as splash pads, community hubs and playgrounds or bicycle a bicycle pumps track so families don't have to drive out of the community to enjoy amenities such as these. So I'll turn this one to Bowden. Read the question again.
Well, I think those are some great suggestions. Uh, uh, we haven't specifically talked about things like bicycle pump tracks or or uh, splash pads at, at this level, but uh, you know this is definitely very valuable things to hear from the community um, in terms of needs that they have. So, um, so I, I think we would give it consideration. We are showing parks and open space, so things like splash pads. <laughs> pardon me, splash pads, um, you know, could be a feature as part of the park's design. So those are all, um, uh, those are all elements that um, would be done at a more detailed level. Um, but there are parks and open space that are proposed um, uh, through this and um, the community hubs and the bicycle pump track. That's a, a good comment. So we'll definitely look at that. Nadia, I have a raised hand. Okay. Um, so Kyle Nielsen, I'm going to bring you into the meeting. Just bear with me for a moment. And you'll just need to unmute, please. You guys hear me all right? I can, thank you. Great. Uh, thanks guys. I'm Kyle Nielsen with Forefront Engineering. Um, I'm here today representing Bob Hodgins who owns the Southwest Parcel, large Southwest Parcel in the plan. I got a few questions. Um, I guess the first one's, um, when will the servicing transportation studies be available? So, um, Bowden, can uh, I'll turn that one to you? Uh, I don't have my schedule of what's, what's at what status right now. Um, let me just see if I can find that. I don't know if anyone else can see Maybe, that. Jill, can you um, pull that up? <clears throat> they are with the um, the township for, uh, for review. Um, and um, so we're hoping that in a couple of weeks they will be uh, made available um, on the project website. Okay. I guess my other, like, my client has kind of two, two main concerns. Um, his property is not really shown within the 25 year window. Um, and we understand you guys are fixed um, based on your population projections. I think when this process started, he expected to kind of still see um, road networks um, and kind of developable area. Um, in those future development lands, um, just to see how his land fit in, regardless of um, assigning specific land uses to them, um, that's that's the one that's the one main comment. That, and I think that builds into kind of the other concern is right now there's some pathways and stormwater facilities, and I think in one concept even some park shown on his property, but. His property is not really within the development window, so um, kind of kind of wondering what the intention is um, to get those to get those facilities built, and um, have you guys thought of any cost sharing mechanisms um, for oversizing and the various things we have to deal with? So. Um... So Kyle, to answer um, the question about the cost sharing. So we are, uh, we have not, um, that's sort of the next step okay. after tonight's meeting. So we know that um, we will meet with the landowners. We, um, the cost sharing arrangements, what does that look like? Those are questions for sure. Um, and we will, uh, we will be having those conversations with the landowners and then the secondary plan will ref have some kind of language reflecting that, but we're not there yet. It, it is a discussion that we will, um, need to undertake in the, in the upcoming weeks for sure. Um, so there's, you know, different ways of, um, how all the financial costs are, are going to, um, you know, be implemented. So that's that's part two of this discussion. Um, and we will reach out to the landowners to discuss that for sure. And I, and I totally understand that. And I think 
The, the biggest thing on that is, you know, you, this is the projection for the next 25 years. We want this to get built right away. Um, we want we want to see this project move forward. So I think um, we want we want to see a plan that's buildable and there's a, a there's a process in place where one landowner is not holding up another, and that that's that's what we want to see. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I um, want to just reiterate as part of this process, um, you know, we will have the official plan amendment, and we're also doing a zoning bylaw amendment. So we're actually zoning these lands so that. They're ready to go. Um, and that will save the landowners and future developers from having to, you know, undertake a separate zoning bylaw amendment process. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, um, and I, the... I think, and I, and I think that's a great, great idea and great thing. I just mm -hmm. want, I just want to make sure that the landowners in this plan have a pathway to get a pipe um, across another person's land. Um, and that that person's properly compensated. That, that's what we want to make sure. Yeah, yeah, we are fully aware that those uh, are are definitely concern concerns and valid ones, and and we have to have those discussions for sure, and we will. Okay. I think that's all I have for now. I'll let someone else talk. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Any other raised hands, Katie? I do, I have um, Latoya Powder has her okay. hand raised, so I will bring her in. And Latoya, I just ask you to unmute, please. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. So it was mentioned that the future land, the future development lands would be pre-zoned, but would the owners be required to come in to do like an official plan amendment and to actually have land uses designated on those properties so just to clarify the the lands that we've shown in the land use concepts um will have zoning the future development area would likely have some kind of a you know future development or uh, development uh, reserve zone so um is your question about the lands that we've shown with the colored land use land no. uses or the future no, develop oh, the yeah. future development okay so the gray lands so um so if the um as i mentioned if the the growth happens sooner than what we um what ends up being put into the secondary plan if it happens sooner the township can uh, and I'll turn over to Bowdoin, but there, the township can bring on, um, you know, another secondary plan process and and carry out, maybe do more detailed studies on those environmental areas. So those, you know, red, orange uh, constraint areas um, and have those discussions. And the thing is, the township doesn't have to wait until that last unit is built, right? That process can start. Maybe it starts a decade or 15 years out or 23 years out we, we don't know um and so, so it's kind of curious to understand then has like did the township staff consider doing like a a master conceptual plan to show what the full 341 acres could look like um for example if you considered a master plan today i, I understand that it probably takes maybe like two years instead of um, a year that by doing a master plan it allows you to provide um, opportunities for like of housing units that are priced affordably and like different ranges of housing units that are developed other than say, for example, fee simple housing units, you know, like condominium style developments closer to uh, County Road 6. And all of that could kind of be done through, through the master planning of this 341 acres. And I did read that in the growth study, Hemson concluded that the remaining 1,000 residential units that were proposed originally forecasted for atmosphere is being shifted to this atmosphere west. And I guess the way that housing is going right now, I, is it really forecasted that these 1,000 units will get taken out in 25 years when in real list that's probably more like a five-year time frame okay so Latoya I'm um 
I'm going to answer your the first thing, and then I'll turn over to Bowden um, to answer the whether the township is considered a master plan and and the um, your units. So, um, um, it is quite common in a secondary plan uh, process and exercise to have uh, lands uh, designated as future development area. And um, there are many examples across Ontario that do that. And uh, I've been involved in some myself. And the, um, you know, the, the when those are brought in, um, again, are tied to the, the phasing and uh, the triggers for phasing. Um, the um, I'll turn it to Bowden and then Michael or Megan can respond to the, um, the EA process as well. So maybe Bowden, um, I think Latoya had asked about the uh, a master plan exercise for all of the land. So I think that was the next comment that Latoya had made. Yep, this was uh, <clears throat> this was an idea brought up uh, uh, recently in in some of the meetings with uh, landowners. Um, it's it's something that we didn't consider at the at the start of the project. Um, I would just say the only thing yeah, again, it's tied to the EA pro, uh, the environmental assessment process, which is tied to the projection numbers that we have to work with uh, at the moment. Um, that we can't. We can't really build out form beyond what those population numbers show. Um, that's just, that's the simple answer. Um, just in terms of land future land uses, again, we don't know if these don't come on stream for 23 years. We don't know what the situation will call for then. Uh, so if we try and determine that now, uh, we might we might totally miss the mark in, in terms of what. What the need is when when those units come on on board, so um, we will definitely we will we will take this idea um, and kick it around a little bit more, but uh, basically, yeah, we have to live with those numbers that that we're working with, and Megan, you can speak to, you know, how that how doing what um, is being suggested would affect our our e municipal class EA submission. Yeah, I mean, the intent of the municipal class EA, the master planning process defined under under that um, that process when we're talking about environmental assessments, I mean, the intent of the, the master plan is is to develop a long range plan for for servicing for an area that's, you know, co coordinated with the future future land uses. So it's it's intended to kind of complement the secondary plan, what we're preparing and and to complement, you know, the the growth and development that's that's targeted through the secondary plan. So the the two, you know, work very closely hand in hand. I guess one thing I'll I'll comment about, you know, limitations of the municipal class EA process is, you know, there there is a, a lapse of time provision for the EA process as well, where, you know, if a project doesn't move forward to implementation within, you know, a certain time frame, then that can cause, you know, a requirement for the proponent to reopen their project, update their studies, reflect changes in conditions in that time. So there are kind of limitations in terms of the, the time horizon as well from an EA perspective. But um, because our, our environmental assessment is being done kind of hand in hand with this secondary plan, the, the two are quite linked and we're focusing on development of, you know, the 25 year time horizon that's being used um, within the secondary plan area. So that's, I guess, just my, my commentary on the, how the municipal class EA process is, is being applied here. Okay. Okay. Got and, it. Okay. Great. Um, maybe we'll go to a Q and A and then, um, uh, and then we'll go back to the raised hand. I'm not sure how many raised hands there are, Katie. No, no more. Okay, so next uh, Q&A. Um, so why is the existing undeveloped area of Amherst View not being tackled first before expansion towards Parrots Bay? There is tons of area that is undeveloped that wouldn't result in such a large loss of wildlife. Uh, how also, 
Uh, how can there be a proposed plan when the land is not sold? And trespassing has occurred several times on existing residents' land. Um, okay, so uh, Bowden, I think I'll turn this over to you. So um, why is the existing undeveloped area of Amherst View not being tackled first before expansion towards Parrots Bay? Um, I'm not sure which undeveloped lands um, are being referred to. Um, so the studies that we've seen uh, is that <clears throat> existing Amherst View is pretty much going to be built out in the next five years. That's one reason why it, that's what that's one reason this whole process was triggered finally was because <clears throat> we're approaching full build out. Uh, so I'm not sure which which lands are being referred to, but but that was very we were very conscious of that. That's what that's what started this whole process was that uh, we were running out of develop developable land within Amherst View um, to accommodate the growth. And maybe Jenna, if you can um, um, chime in here on maybe just maybe a little bit more um, info on the township's infrastructure master plan, as maybe some are not familiar with it, or um, maybe just an update. And you know what what is it accounting for in terms of you know infill development and that sort of um, you know other areas besides the Amherst View West. Certainly, thanks, Nadia. Um, yeah, so concurrent to this process, the township is undertaking an infrastructure master plan process um, where we're looking um, mostly at the sort of more urbanized areas um, of the township and we're looking at um, water servicing, sanitary servicing, stormwater requirements and transportation requirements. Um, so through this process is, is, as I said, running concurrently, um, sort of slightly delayed from the secondary plan process because we're going to be folding in some of the infrastructure needs from the secondary plan process once they're determined into the infrastructure master plan process. So we expect um, late this year or early next year for that process to be completed. Um, we will have other uh, public consultation opportunities associated with that process. It is also following the municipal class environmental assessment process. Um, so we expect this summer and into the fall to be doing further public consultation um, on that. But through that process, we are looking at some of the um, some of the connection, some of the areas where some of these connections will need to be made from the secondary plan lands to, to existing infrastructure. So we're reviewing um, our water and sewage treatment plants to ensure that we have sufficient capacity to be providing treatment for um, the full composite of lands that will come online, um, both in the Amherst U West area and in other areas of the township over the 20, same 25 year planning horizon. Um, and also looking at, at, you know, transportation needs and that sort of thing in terms of um, intersection improvements, active transportation elements, um, and those, those sorts of things. So the, the processes are meant to be complementary, um, and we, we are going to be folding in the, the results of the secondary plan infrastructure needs into the infrastructure master plan for the whole, for the whole township. Okay, thanks, Jenna. Katie, are there any um, raised hands? There are not at the moment. Um, okay. I can address the next question. Okay. Uh, so how many attendees in this meeting? Uh, currently we have 56 participants in total that includes the nine panelists. So um, 47 attendees. Um, and actually I'm just now seeing a raised hand so I can go ahead if you like Nadia. Okay, and sure. um, Mark Toe from IBI Group into the meeting. Okay. Mark, please go ahead. Hi, good evening. So my name is Mark Tao. I'm a planner with the IBI group. So we uh, represent Peter and Mary Frances Davis, who own an approximately 20 hectare parcel on the east side of uh, Parrots Bay. So the their particular parcel is well outside the area of land proposed or shown to be designated, but 
they certainly still have a strong interest in the future of, of their lands and uh, have an interest in um, having them to be available for development in the future, uh, or at least a portion of them. So I'm here tonight just to speak uh, with respect to that. Um, there's been some discussion and certainly emails and correspondence um, from, from landowners in the area um, with respect to the designation of lands. And certainly we're aware and understand the, the limits of designating lands through uh, official plan or secondary plan being limited to a 25 year supply. Um, however, so I'll speak to that for, on a couple of particular points. Um, the first is, I guess, that infrastructure planning is not limited to that 25 year timeline. Um, and certainly infrastructure under the PPS is specifically exempted from that, from that timeline. And that might be something that's relevant to this particular process in terms of looking at the build out, the broader build out of that area um, beyond 25 years. And similarly, the land supply beyond 25 years can't be designated um, through formal planning instruments such as secondary plans. Uh, MISPIs aren't restricted from preparing broader visionary documents for lands that are anticipated to be developed in the future. Um, and these could be tied to infrastructure planning as well to help assist with, uh, with those, uh, those documents as well. And practically speaking, I guess in this case with a secondary plan expansion or an urban boundary expansion um, where a significant proportion of the land to be expanded upon or developed upon is owned by private landowners. Uh, certainly in our experience, it helps to provide a broader vision to those landowners so that they have an understanding of how their lands um, can fit in um, or, or not within that long-term vision for the area. And that helps in turn uh, give them um, a sense of uh, buy-in or uh, commitment to what they can expect. Um, and that contributes directly to the success of the plan. If landowners who are having lands designated or, or likely to be designated in the future, um, if they have an understanding of what that looks like, um, you know, they may be more supportive, more willing to deal with other landowners who need their lands for, for various uh, infrastructure needs, et cetera. So um, I would encourage, I guess, consideration of that separate visionary document to provide a, a longer term conceptual plan. Um, municipalities spent a lot of money and a lot of staff and, and consultant resources examining a broader area, including doing studies of a much broader area. And I think um, those that work can be used towards uh, preparing perhaps a a broader visionary document um, that paints a, a picture, even in general terms of, of what that future could look like. And I think that would be helpful to getting landowners um, uh, to participate um, and um, yeah, participate in the success of the project. And then just finally, with respect to population projections and resultant land needs, um, as a land use planner, we've, we've had some discussions about um, you know the market in in Loyalist Township and and what the population projections have shown historically and also what um, we maybe can expect in the future and the one thing that's come up um, is the idea under the PPS in section one two one G and one four one and one four three. The policies speak to municipalities uh, providing housing based on quote regional market areas, and that's not limited to you know a county or a specific geography uh, tied to municipal boundaries. It's as defined by the PPS. It refers to an area that has a high degree of social and economic interaction, and I think that applies well to Amherstview specifically in relation to um, the Kingston context. And where there is that high degree of social and economic interaction, Zamersu um, is very much a bedroom community for Kingston. Um, so anyone familiar with, with the growth of Kingston and the historic maintenance of its urban boundary and you know, the kind of the limited steps towards expanding that urban boundary that are likely in the future, um, I think it's, it's reasonable to assume that there will be a significant interaction between uh, population projections and land needs out of Kingston, and, that, and and how it affects 
Loyalist Township, and particularly Amherst View. So I think looking at population projections and land needs through that regional market area lens, I know the PPS might be worthwhile considering um, in a fairly unique um, situation such as Amherst View and, and that, that relationship with Kingston. So anyway, I look forward to future conversations with the consultant team and staff and, and certainly thankful for the work and the opportunities uh, to meet to date. So, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Bowden, did, uh, did you want to uh, make any finer comments on Mark's comments? <laughs> well, I know that uh, I, I agree with a lot of, almost everything that Mark said. Um, I think these are great points to, for us to take away and to, and, and to, and to consult internally um, and maybe even with council if they have any appetite to, uh, to do a separate visionary document for that's not part of the secondary plan, but you know, just looks at this a little more closely. And uh, yeah, that's an interesting idea. And I think also, um, you know, what I think we can, um, you know, look at is also the townships infrastructure master plan and sort of painting that higher level picture, I think for, um, you know, for the future landowners, I think that would be, um, good to, to show and, and tie that in. So uh, let us take that away and see, um, you know, how that can be. As Michael mentioned during his presentation, though, like the servicing is looking at those lands. Are, they are included as part of the overall servicing, you know, review. Um, so it's not like there's a fine line um, on the servicing. So I just wanted to reiterate that uh, that point. Um, okay. Um, so the next Q and A um, is the question is: Will there be development in other areas of Loyalist Township over twenty five years? So, um, Bowden or Andrea, did you want to uh, respond to that question? Well, I could start, and Andrea can kick in if she likes. Um, yes. So uh, we are getting. Well, as I said earlier, that the the Hemson study and projections were for the entire township. And we are seeing pressure um, to in Odessa, Odessa West specifically, to to develop there. Certainly in Bath as well. So yes, there there, there are um, uh, development pressures which will result in I'm I'm assuming in development in other areas of the township. You have any, you want to add anything to that? Um, no, I think that that's a fair comment, um, Bowden, and there's, you know, a number of various active planning applications right now in both um, Bath and Odessa, so that um, development is continuing there, and there are um, some lands available there that are continuing, but again, um, being monitored as well for, for those lands and their future build out and those opportunities, so we, we do review that and, and monitor that and keep track of um, what's happening that way in, in order to um, determine if there will be additional land needs um, in the other urban settlement areas of the township as well. Great, thank you. Katie, um, just just to double check, has anyone joined by phone or no callers? Okay, any other raised hands? Okay, thanks everyone for putting up with my <laughs> checking in. It's uh, um, one day we'll be all in a meeting room. Um, okay, next question is, uh, with collections onto County Road 6, do you anticipate the need of traffic lights at the intersections of Amherst Drive or Kildare? Um, Jenna, do you wanna take that one? Sure, I can I can answer that. So um, I'm, I'm assuming the question is in reference to at County Road 6, and Amherst Drive or County Road 6 in Kildare. So um, we're, we're working with the county there. Um, so County Road 6 is a county road, um, whereas Amherst Drive and Kildare are local township roads. Um, so the members of the um, infrastructure services uh, department at the County of Lennox and Addington are participating um, on the technical advisory committee for the secondary plan. Um, so they are very much in tune with what is being um, 
considered here. And um, the, the secondary plan will be looking at sort of um, those intersections and, and the, the traffic that is expected to be um, hitting those intersections with what's being proposed. Um, there are plans to improve the south end of County Road 6, um, you know, within the next five to seven years. Um, so considerations for improvements that are necessary to facilitate the secondary plan work um, will be planned and included in, in those upgrades as they come online. Uh, Jenna, while you're still there, I'm just going to jump to a question that's down. Um, can you advise on the time horizon on the I, uh, on the infrastructure master plan, please? That was a question. Yes. So the infrastructure master plan is also looking at um, at the next 25 years, so growth requirements, um, and also looking at at um, you know remedial or legislative requirements and those sorts of things. But it also has a 25 year uh, planning horizon. Great, thank you. Okay, um, next question in the Q&A. What happens when you build on a watershed, example Lost Creek? How does this impact water flow above and below ground and will it have any impact to the neighborhood below? Michael, do you want to start? Okay, thanks. Yeah, certainly. Um, great question. Thank you for sharing. Um, so certainly whenever any development occurs, there can be direct impacts associated. Um, the most, in the most traditional sense, when a development occurs within a watershed and there is more hardscaping, so converting land from pervious um, grassy areas, areas with much soils to an impervious situation, so paving or more building hardscapes, there's a potential risk of an increase of runoff generation. And this doesn't just um, impact the quantity of runoff water that enters into creeks or, or systems, it also may impact the quality of the water and potential for contaminants to uh, go across the surface into um, the watershed area. Um, this can have impacts both to surface and groundwater components, such as the natural recharge of groundwater conditions. And if quantity control is not kept in check, um, it can cause things such as flooding downstream or adverse impacts. Um, there can also be impacts upstream of situations if bottlenecks are occurred from an increase of quantity of water. Um, so within the Lost Creek area specifically, it's why it's important um, in this secondary plan that it was reviewed that a target of reducing um, impacts of generation of runoff essentially into the Lost Creek area will be contained through stormwater management features. This will be inclusive of recommendations around low impact development. And there's actually an opportunity in the, because of the technical guideline adaptation of reducing post runoff flow conditions by 20%, um, there's an opportunity to actually reduce potential of flooding um, and also improving water quality prior to outlet into the adjacent wetlands and Lost Creek watershed area. Um, this is an overall objective for the development of the secondary plan area. Um, and it will ensure that the development can move forward and account for any adverse effects strategically um, to uh, essentially minimize or, if if anything, um, reduce current adverse impacts due to uh, high water flows caused by runoff. Um, the analysis and common practice today is also to account for climate change considerations and the increased severity of flows due to more frequent um, high level storms. Um, so again, this the opportunity for development here and the consideration of stormwater management facilities um, is to mitigate um, any adverse impacts um, due to stormwater. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Katie, any raised hands? 
No, okay. Okay, the next question is, this is a question for Bowden and Andrea. Um, has there been consideration to change Amherst View East zoning to allow more density such as granny suites and improving existing commercial and retail infrastructure? Okay, I'll start off and Andrea can jump in, but uh, just to say that the new official plan will be enabling when it comes to granny suites, we do have, we'll have new policies. So that official plan was adopted by council um, in September. It's currently um, with county council for review uh, and they, they are bringing it for um, a decision uh, on the 23rd, I believe. Um, so that should be adopted once those policies come into place that that will uh, make things like granny suites legal um, across the board. So, uh, so and, and we will be changing the zoning to to specifically address granny suites. They'll still have to be uh, they'll still have to uh, comply with the building code, and all aspects of that. But yes, so we are we are going to see policies that enable more of those things. And in terms of existing commercial and retail infrastructure, I'm not sure. Uh, not sure what that, that means exactly, but. Um, so we are building commercial into this plan uh, and, and, and we are trying to build like neighborhood commercial as well as perhaps uh, some, um, something higher order uh, of commercial use and retail use. So that's part of this plan. Uh, and there are properties in the uh, existing Amherst view uh, that are currently vacant, but zoned for that kind of stuff. So um, hopefully those, those will come online uh, soon as well. Okay, great. Um, so here's another question in the Q&A. Is there any thought into attracting more family doctors to Amherst View due to the growth? I'm not sure who from the township can answer that one. Give it a try. Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, one of the things we would like to encourage more of is uh, is exactly that. We've had studies the county has done um, uh, in terms of economic development opportunities uh, and certainly more professionals, including doctors, is one of the desired outcomes um, that we would like to see. Um, so I would say generally, yes. Uh, I, can't, I can't speak specifically to what we can expect in, in Amherst View West, but Generally speaking, yes, we are very supportive of that. Katie, any raised hands? I don't have any raised hands at the moment. Okay. Um, okay, we have another question. Um, will more high density housing be built specifically apartment rentals? Um, so the um, the high density that we're showing um, on the draft land use concepts would enable uh, apartments to be built. Uh, the zoning would follow suit, um, so that the zoning would permit that. In terms of ownership, that um, that's really done by um, um, the the uh, you know the developer. Um, I, I should mention, and I apologize for not mentioning this as part of the presentation, but um, there are lands within the secondary plan area that are owned by the municipality. Um, and so there was a question that I read and I, I apologize, I didn't respond to it, but um, the question was why uh, have a proposed plan if the lands are not to be sold or if the lands haven't sold. So there are lands that are owned by the municipality and um, you know as on the um, um, the private lands as interest arises you know private landowners can sell or 
uh, you know, their land or not um, as the time comes. Um, maybe Katie, if you could pull up one of the land use concepts and we can show where the municipal lands are and those municipal lands are designated in all three land use concepts. So um, we can show that. I apologize again, I should have uh, pointed that out. These are all really great questions, by the way, so keep them coming. <laughs> Okay, so um, so I'm not sure if uh, I have, uh, oh, thank you, someone is outlining. <laughs> thank you. Those are the municipally owned lands. So it's, it's a good chunk of the Northeast quadrant, if you will. So it includes, uh, um, you know, some commercial, well, on this concept, uh, the stormwater management facilities, some park space, uh, low, medium, and high uh, on this concept. So uh, it, a good chunk of the lands are municipally owned. Um, and so um, if the uh, township was to um, provide or work with a, a partner with, um, you know, a housing organization or any of the, the other potential funding opportunities, um, you know, apartment rentals could be considered. So we would not specify that because ownership really is based on market and on the ultimate uh, developer, landowner. Um, okay, so I think I've answered those two questions. Um, any, it is 742 on my computer clock. Any raised hands? No. Um, okay, why don't we uh, go to the next step slide. And again, if something does pop up in someone's mind, please feel free to continue to use the Q&A function or the raise hand function. Uh, so just to the next steps towards the end of the presentation, please, Katie. That's okay. Um, as we're um, waiting uh, for that slide, I do want to uh, remind everyone that uh, this presentation will be made available on the project website. Um, and um, in addition, the reports that are uh, will be made available as well on the project website. And I'm going to... Um, 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 sorry, it's been a long day. The project, the studies that will be on the project website uh, tomorrow morning will be the growth management report, um, the natural heritage and constraints report, the climate change assessment, the phase one environmental site assessment, the archaeological overview, and the preliminary geotechnical and hydrogeological assessments. So those are ones that can be reviewed if you're interested uh, in any of those tomorrow morning. The other ones will be forthcoming. Um, just um, um, keep checking the project website or um, you, know, you can follow up with, with the township. So um, fully appreciate that the land use concepts, you'll probably want to look at them, zoom in, um, probably have uh, further comments and questions. So we welcome um, your comments. If you have any questions on the draft reports, um, feel free to send them in. So uh, the email specifically for this project is secondaryplan at loyalist.ca, which is at the bottom of the screen. Um, the uh, the slide that Megan presented on the evaluation of um, the criteria, if you have any questions or comments, um, feel free to, to uh, send those in. We are hoping to receive comments um, by the end of March. Um, we have a lot of work to do. 
we will be um, meeting with the landowners. We will be uh, refining the land use concept. We will consider the comments that have come in to date. Um, we will be taking um, a preferred land use concept back to the technical advisory committee and the coordination committee. Uh, we're hoping for early April. Then we would come back to um, uh, another virtual public open house uh, to be held in spring and that'll be a big one. We're going to have the draft secondary plan. We're going to have the draft official plan amendment, draft zoning bylaw amendment, and the draft urban design standards. So it will be a lot of material. Um, however, um, I don't think any of us will be sleeping. No, I'm just joking. Um, there's a lot of material, but as I mentioned, um, you know, the items about cost sharing, phasing, uh, implementation, all of those things still need to be discussed. And we will have meetings with the landowners and we will, um, you know, regroup with, with township staff uh, to sort of, um, you know, find those days and, and time. So, um, I will, before turning it back to uh, Bowdoin, just checking with Katie if there's any other raised hands, any other comments or final questions. Okay, um, I, on behalf of um, WSP and, and um, our team, oh, there is a question. I'm or, sorry, a hand has just popped up. Okay. So, um, uh, Bob Hodgson, I will just bring you in. And I'll ask you to please unmute Bob and please go ahead. I just want to say I'm impressed with uh, how much work goes into the secondary plan. And I think everyone's doing a great job at it. Um, the one thing I think we, we, we're, we're looking at here is we're into a bit of a housing issue right now, a housing demand issue. And I think Loyalist is in a great position to, uh, to probably jump on that and, uh, and uh, sort of provide some uh, affordable housing for the next generation. So I think uh, I think Loyalist is in a position, I think what needs to happen and what I'm getting out of this is, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not, we're not, we're gonna run out of land here shortly with the amount that we got in this 25 year plan. So. I think I'd like to see Loyalist give uh, WSP direction to expand their uh, development a bit and and be ready for the uh, and provide affordable housing for some for the next generation. Whether that be secondary suites, which are coming into play, or or the zoning for that, and I think uh, if you look at our neighboring uh, being the city of Kingston. Um, you know, I, I think they're, they're, they're pretty well blocked up with, uh, their development. So I think, uh, Loyalist is in a great position to, uh, um, jump on the market and develop if that's what the direction they wanted to go in. Um, Bob, thank you for your comments. I just wanted to clarify, um, on the affordable housing, are you, uh, like our, our, the policies would would enable that to happen in terms of a variety of housing forms, um, and then the so is that what you're referring to? Because I can have I'm happy to expand on that. Well, I'm just looking at supply and demand for housing because mm -hmm. we, we can all look at the real estate market right now, and and uh, part of the reason why the housing prices is going skyrocketing is the, the demand for the housing. So. I think based on that, um, the only way to correct that, or one of the ways to correct that is to flood the market with housing, supply. Mm -hmm. with supply. So I think yeah. we're, we're in a position to, or Loyalist is in a position to, uh, to, to uh, work on that. So um, I will turn it over to Bowden for any further comments, but I can, um, uh, just let every let 
you and everyone know, um, you know, we work, um, Jill and I are working on quite a few land development projects uh, in Ottawa. And um, there's um, definitely been an uptake here on coach house development. So we have a lot of um, projects with that. Um, and any policy that we plan on drafting will, um, you know, ensure affordable, supportive housing, uh, different forms. So um, the Planning Act right now was changed a couple of years ago to enable what's called additional residential units. So the term secondary dwelling units, like the basement apartments, that term is no longer used. It's additional residential units. And it enables... Um, properties, you know, singles, semis, towns, and depending to uh, what, what the municipality would like, but it does enable, um, for example, a single detached property to have two more units. Um, and whether those units are in the basement, above a garage, granny suites have a, um, um, have a, a different framework under the Planning Act because there is a development agreement that needs to be registered. Um, and so there's some specific Planning Act um, uh, requirements there. Um, so we, we would build that in, the zoning would be uh, reflect that as well. So um, just to say, we, we, we are also on the other side and we know that um, there's a need to ensure that there's flexible tools for implementation to enable affordable housing to occur. Bowden, did you want to say anything else? All those are all great points. Uh, like I would just add that um, we are, in terms of affordable rental housing, uh, um, we are working with the county social services uh, actively all the time, um, trying to, uh, when they get grant money for, for projects to find suitable land for them to develop in. We have, uh, as was pointed out, we are, I think, the largest landowner in the secondary plan area. So the, there may be opportunities uh, for something there. I expect there will be. Um, yeah, so I just add that. Um, <laughs> sorry, Bob, it's... No, I sorry. said, yeah, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, and so the last question we have is uh, the way things are opening up, is it possible that the next meeting would be in person as opposed to virtual? Um, so thank you for the comment and question. Um, it, it could be a possibility. I guess it depends on where, uh, you know, our local health, <laughs> uh, local health um, measures are. Um, I just received an email from the school board saying that masks are no longer mandatory after March break. Um, so we can definitely put that um, as a discussion and, you know, we'll can see how things evolve and what the, you know, the, where we are in the, the pandemic um, and local health measures. And um, so thank you for, for asking that. Um, so we are at 7.54. Uh, so I will turn it over to Bowden. So again, on behalf of the WSP team, thank you very much for your time, your comments and questions. Uh, we look forward to continuing the dialogue. Um, we're here to work together to, um, you know, plan for this next area uh, of growth and development. And um, we are... Um, excited that there's a lot of enthusiasm and great comments. And so thank you for your time. I hope you have a great weekend and I will turn it over to Bowden to, to, uh, to close it off. So thank you from all of us. Thanks, Nadia. Um, well, we certainly threw a lot of information at you today um, and it's a lot to digest and you, you, a lot of you are seeing those concepts for the first time. So um, I, I, incur I urge you to, uh, to dive deeper into this material. Um, you, you can, well, this presentation will be online. Uh, you can look through what was said today and continue to give us great comments like you have. So I would, I would really strongly encourage that. All comments will be recorded and considered and, and responded to. So thank you very much. Thank you very much team for um, 
a great job today. Also, I'll thank you for all the attendees uh, and the great questions.